pripreme srstu po pozdravu v jeziku države, v kateri smo in naroda, ki je tako širokogrudno. 1, 2, 3, 4, ja. Ki tako širokogrudno podpira Katalonce. In nažalost, narod bolj širokogrudno kot vsaj velik del slovenske politike. Ampak je še vedno dovolj v slovenski politiki in javnosti še več ljudje, ki razumejo, zakaj gre v Kataloniji. Na vse zadnje gre za to, danes gledano z evropskega stališča, da se v Kataloniji brani evropska demokracija in načela evropske demokracije, na katerih počiva tudi Evropska unija. I would like to apologize to our distinguished guests today. I see so many of people who have written the history of this country, who have participated actively in the process of self-determination of Slovenia, in the process of writing the constitution of this country. And uh, I am I am humbled with, uh, with uh, your presence today and with the attitude Slovenian people is showing. This is a democratic European attitude, it's as simple as that. And whoever uses police or court in order to make a nation fear in to make it humiliated. Whoever thinks that by humiliation of the political leaders, like those friends of mine who are sitting in the court of Madrid, I think in long term makes a wrong account. He is in conflict with the history and with the, with the contemporary values, democratic values, let me say that well. And this is the reason why we have this distinguished guest today. I am so proud that we managed to bring him to Slovenia, even in the days when he is very busy. Yesterday he had a, a meeting with a, his own European future as candidate and I was very happy when the president told me that he intends to open his battle for the mandate in European Parliament in Slovenia. And <coughs> I think for this he deserves a, an applause. Eh? <laughs> With with, with him, I, I am greeting the, his two ministers of Catalan government, Mrs. Clara Ponsati. <laughs> and Mr. Antoni Comin. You are very welcome. <laughs> I'm... I know that there were many, many contacts between Slovenia and uh, Catalonia in the past. So we are building on this tradition. This is something what some Spanish politicians, some Slovenian politicians also, don't understand. That tradition means something. It is an obligation. It is a token of, of mutual respect. And we should pursue this way and sometimes say no to those who obviously are demonstrating different values and don't understand that they will be called sooner or later in the future for what they did. Uh, I don't want to take any more of your time. I would just like to greet some Catalans among yours I am getting regularly 
some messages encouraging and uh, nice. Aurora, this is you. Ah, okay, please get on. <laughs> it is it is first time that I see you live, but for almost two years I am getting regularly your your messages, nice and encouraging, and thank you. And I will I will I will say what you sent in my la in your last message. She said. If it is true that the President Puigdemont is coming, I will be there. And I will be there in whatever way. I can carry the suitcases, I can translate, I can help in any other way, but I will be there. So, you are very welcome. Pre <laughs> President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear all. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to all of you for attending that event. Thank you also my colleagues uh, who are living with me in exile to, to come with me in such wonderful country. And I want to ex explain before I start to address you my, my little short conference, I want to say clearly I expected that day since several months ago. Before I was arrested in Germany, we planned to be in Slovenia. Um, and for one thing, I expected to be here, to say thank you very much to Slovenian people and some of one of the most prominent uh, politi politicians here, like Ivo Weigel, who are very in deep committed to democracy, to right of self-determination. Slovenia was always, since you're fighting for democracy, for freedom, one of the references for all the peoples in Europe fighting for democracy, for freedom. And I'm happy to be here. It's not my first time here. I was here in July 1991, a very special moment for you in your history. I was a witness of your process uh, I was here directly seeing your efforts in order to be a free country with the dream to join the European Union, with the, the, the dream to join the same country as we feel Europe is, is it. I want, to, I, I, I want to try to explain not only what's going on now in Catalonia and Spain, I think most of you know perfectly there is a political trial against uh, politicians, or there is a persecution, uh, ideological persecution, etc. I want to explain why we, Catalan, a rich region, uh, a region that you probably know when you can live uh, with a, a good level of life, um, are trying to be an independent state, an independent republic, and doing that uh, way using only a non-violent means, uh, calling for more radical democracy. So it's impossible to understand what's going on if you are looking our crisis only with the glasses, when you are looking the traditional nationalistic revolutions in the 19th or 20th centuries. With only with that glasses, it's impossible to understand why we, Catalan people, has decided since uh, October uh, 2017 to start that path, very complicated path, to be an independent nation. So, um, we have not started the path to become independent republic in order to build a classical nation state to do the same things like Spain, but only changing the name, the flag, the borders, and in a small side. For that reason, I was not living in exile. I'm pro-independence because we want to build a different democratic society with a different relationship between power 
and citizens with a different um, role of the citizens in a modern, peaceful democracy. That is our goal. That is clear our goal. And that is possible now and not 20 years ago in our case or 40 years ago because now we are under the, the new paradigm of the fourth industrial revolution. As you know, probably, all the industrial revolutions have changed ideologies and the way uh, of we organizing power. The struggle for workers' rights is a consequence of the first industrial revolution, like fascism, Nazism, communism, and a liberal democracy are consequences of the second one. All industrial revolution change societies, and social change imply political change. All the revolutions we have now have generated, among other effects, social inequalities as a consequence of an equal redistribution of benefits and progress they have made. Progress has not been granted for everyone. everyone. Today, for example, according to the latest data from the World Bank in 2015, more than 700 million people live in extreme poverty. And half of the world's population live on less than $5.5 per day. That's just if we only measure the monetary poverty. Despite all the progress of the previous industrial revolutions, eight out of nine people in a sample of near 120 countries have deficiencies in food, energy, or basic infrastructure services. So we are in a new industrial revolution, like the previous one. It will also lead to social change and force political changes. Changes that will affect our organization as a society, our way of exercising power, generating new fundamental rights, revealing unknown threats, fears, and challenges that the ideologies and power known to date will not have answer. The challenge is to know what change liberal democracy needs to make in order to respond to it, uh, to that challenges. Where to guide the change? The first thing to know is that today the main risk is a democratic regression around the world. A resurgence of authoritarianism and a strong political leadership, as well as a return to a state nationalism, usually called patriotism, in response to fears over the social revolution provoked by the Industrial Revolution. According to the Freedom House report of 2019, this year, last year, 2018, was the 30th consecutive year of declining democracy in the world. The title of such a report is eloquent, Democracy in Retreat. If we add other reports, such as the World Values Survey, it is clear that there is a problem with younger generation. 60% of those born in the 50s consider essential to live in a democrati democratically governed country. Less than 45%, less than 45% of those born in the 80s agree with this statement. According to the same report, the number of citizens who prefer a strong political leader who should not bother with parliaments and elections has increased considerably. One of the reasons for the decline of democracy and the increase in populism and patriotism is the growing distance between institutions and citizenship. The weak disposition of Western democracies to change relations with citizens. 
the fourth industrial revolution will have an impact on all of this. The context in which it occurs is characterized, among others, by the following circumstances. Very important in the case of the Catalan struggle for independence. First, the conventional concept of identity and citizenship is in crisis and the nation state feels threatened. The nation state was born in the 19th century under a simple and centralizing idea. One nation, one language, one culture. Today, in a globalized world, with multiple identities, multilinguistical and multicultural, this idea is ridiculous. But it still affects the right of citizenship. Adhering to a state means still adhering to that notion. Second, the obsolescence of the liberal democracy as we have understood it. Normally, elites with political and economical power have always been cultural and intellectual elites. Groups of people and social classes with access to training and information that are reserved for a very small minority. And they usually had to lead masses of people with limited levels of education and information. Today, a large part of the Western population has a high level of education and access to the same information as the majority of the ruling class. There is no option for democratic paternalism. We cannot manage democracy in the same way we are managed during the last century. Third, a format and informed citizenship that demands to participate and who knows that there is enough technology to make it possible. He, that, he does not ask to participate in an election list as the only way to do politics. He wants to help politics from his position. Citizens claim to be empowered and want to live in a society that takes benefits for their cooperation, participation, and commitment to prioritize the common good. And fourth, the real possibility that the groups of citizens organize themselves outside the states and create their own systems in competition or replacing those which are specific to the states, for example, currency with the cryptocurrency, banks, geopolitical influence, security, and being able to organize plebiscites, consultations, and referendums that determine the decision-making process of governments. It is about finding ways in which democracy fits into this context and leads changes. How democracy creates a new association with technology to, extend, to strengthen itself and strengthen freedom in the world how to create new standards of governance that increase freedom, security, and human rights in the world. The challenge is to fight the author authoritarian threat in the world by giving citizens education, information, and adequate tools to integrate permanently into the decision-making chain of democracies. The citizens' approach must count in every decision and representative democracy is not enough to ensure it. Technology allows the alliance, until now impossible, between representative democracy and participatory democracy, so that the governments of liberal democracies can be more effective, transparent, and controlled by the people, while allowing citizens to recover their sovereignty and with the capacity to manage its relationship with political power in a plan of greater freedom. Governments must change. They must improve, and they are a threat. They know that the Industrial Revolution will take, will take away power and control. But we all know that governments are needed, and rules are needed. However, we want these governments and standards 
to always be a consequence of the popular will and to allow citizens a much more direct control and decisive and permanent participation. As the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights say in the 21st article, and that is not new, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of the government. Our goal, when we are fighting for independence, when we are facing that serious consequences in our lives, people in jail, people living in exile, uh, apart from our families, our goal is this. Our goal is this. It's to improve our democracy, to serve better our citizens. And that is necessary, is made, need to make in the European frame. We are fighting for Europe. We are not fighting for ourselves only. We are know that the Catalan Revolution, the Catalan struggle, the way we uh, has done that successful uh, proof um, of the organization in the 1st of October referendum is the way in that uh, European Union must improve. Without democracy, there is no future for us. Without democracy, small countries like you are threatened by the big one. And as we probably know better than us, is the moment when the small and middle uh, nations rules um, leading improving democracy in the world. Look at the last uh, ranking made by United Nations uh, to, for to know the happiest countries in the world. The last one. Look at the ten, the top ten countries. The first, the second, the third. Look at that. And you will find the ten, eight of that are are less than 10 million inhabitants. So small is better. Small uh, bring citizens living in that country is more able to manage challenges for the future and to join the efforts that are, has been done from other countries in order to ensure peace. That is our main goal, peace, freedom, human rights, social progress, uh, fighting against climate change. That is the goals we share. And in order to do that and to succeed in that goal, we need, as you, to have the tools as an own state, the tools of a state. Thank you very much. And uh, well, once again, thank you very much for your support to Catalan Cours. Thank you very much, Mr. President. You have chosen to put the, what's happening in, in between Catalonia and, uh, and, and uh, Madrid, between the Spanish people and the uh, Spanish-speaking people and the uh, Catalan people, you have put it into the broader frame, not only Europe, but general and, and universal values. And I think this is, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is also why these people here are sitting with us today. Uh, I'm not able to greet everybody and, uh, and, uh, and uh, to mention everybody, but I would like to say that in our academic crisis, in intellectual crisis, you would find again and again, if you come, partners for such a analysis and such a, such a dialogue. On the other side, you will find people who are asking more simple questions, uh, pol actual policy-related questions. When I was recently in, uh, in the hearing of the Supreme Court, testimony as, as, as testimony for the defense, of Catalan political prisoners, I was struck, it was one day after the parliamentary elections, I was st struck by the fact that whoever spoke about the problem of Catalonia was speaking about uh, 
enemy entity within the Spanish borders. So no empathy, no identification, no whatsoever attempt to speak about universal values like like tolerance, like readiness to, to dialogue, to solve the problems with political means, with negotiations, with the understanding of the other side's reasons. So this is, a, this is actually the major misunderstanding in the Spanish situation right now, and with the, with the attitude of the Spanish to Catalans. No? And I was very worried and depressed about it. I can imagine even, even in the former Yugoslavia, where the controversies were very deep and some prejudice were very deep. But on final account, nobody prohibited referendums. The referendums took place. And in Slovenia, it was a referendum for independent state. And you had a referendum in Montenegro with a similar situation, very tight majority, but the referendum took place and it was not contested. You had a referendum in Macedonia. It was very close, but nobody contested the very sense of having a referendum not to speak about Scotland or, 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 or uh, Quebec. So I think this is, this is what, what, what worries me, and I think what makes astonished many of us here in Slovenia. How come a normal dialogue cannot take place in, 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 in Catalonia? No? But now I would like to invite you I'm looking at my old friend, uh, Dimitri Rupel, and I must, I must mention that he was the chief observer at the referendum of the 1st of October 17. And maybe, maybe, maybe it would be right, Dimitri, if you would, you would say, how did you see the referendum? How did you see, how did you feel? What did you feel when you saw that there was an attempt to, to not to allow a referendum, but to fight it with all means of repression, with brutal uh, beating of the elderly people who came to the polls and, and so on. So, so maybe, maybe it is correct to invite you to as the next speaker, please. Uh, what, what, what language do I use? English. Okay. Uh, I'm extremely honored and happy to be able to be present at this uh, occasion. Uh, President uh, Puigdemont, um, if I may say so, is an old friend. I was um, in uh, Barcelona uh, during a very I would say, very critical period of um, Catalan, Catalonian history. Now, um, I have written about uh, the events uh, in 1917. I have reported on, on, on whatever went on on Slovenian television, for other media as well. Um, I have nothing new to tell, but uh, if I have been invited to repeat myself, I would like to say that uh, Catalonia reminded me quite uh, closely of uh, Slovenia in 1991 or 1990 even. Uh, our plebiscite has been, has been a, a slightly different uh, event, but still uh, uh, the referendum of uh, November nine, uh, 2017 has been, has been in many ways um, 
I would say, in my, in my imagination, in my soul, in, in my uh, perspective, a uh, uh, repetition of, of the events uh, that uh, went on in Slovenia back in 1990 and 1991. Um, of course, the situation was, was tense, but I only realized, if I may say so, I realized um, the um, critical nature of, of, of uh, uh, whatever went on um, after having visited polling stations and, and after having uh, seen the demolition that the police have done, after I have um, spoken with the victims of, of, of <laughs> those rubber bullets and so on and so on, it was really a very a very critical and very tense situation. Um, but of course, the, the, the uh, euphoria prevailed. <laughs> the, the positive feeling, of course, in, 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 uh, around myself, uh, yourself uh, being in the first, in the, first uh, in, in the front um, of the stage, of course, um, the, the feeling was of uh, being, uh, being present at a very important historical even event, and um, uh, I, I, I was happy to, to be there. I was indeed honored and happy to be there. Now, uh, afterwards, uh, things started to complicate themselves, to, 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 to um, go in the wrong direction, if I may say so. Um, and um, in a way, I was questioning myself whether, you know, the advice or the comments that I made in Barcelona in 2017 were correct. I was, I remember our conversation, Mr. President, when, when um, I quoted to you uh, former, now, um, late Secretary of State of the United States of America, Eagleburger, when he said to us, when independence of Slovenia was not yet, um, you know, accomplished, he said, do facts. <laughs> that was his quotation, do facts. And indeed, by saying this, Eagleburger has, has uh, encouraged us to, to do facts, and Slovenia in Slovenia, we have done a lot of facts um, in 1991 and, um, of course, later uh, during our fight for international recognition. The situation in 1991 was, of course, different from the one that you are facing today. And I'm so sorry that, you know, the historical moment is no longer, is no longer alive the way that it was uh, back in 1991. Of course, 1991 was, was, was the time of, of uh, uh, the end of the, of the Cold War. It was a time of, of uh, um, uh, uh, collapse of, of uh, communist Soviet Union. Um, it was a time of uh, uh, democratic movements. Of course, it was Berlin Wall, there was the Paris Charter, and so on and so on. So it, it, was, a, it was an entirely different situation. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when I say that I sort of <laughs> experienced similar feelings when being in, in Catalonia, of course, I, I must have made a mistake. I mean, I, I, I was perhaps too... Slovenian oriented for the situation that you had, but still um, uh, your cause is just and your cause is right and and uh, your arguments are are um, uh, untouchable so to say we, we cannot we cannot um, we cannot oversee um, we cannot um, we cannot overlook the the, the uh, um, importance of whatever goes on in Catalonia. So, um, we have understood you, we shall continue to understand you, 
understanding you. Um, how much we can help, I don't know. Uh, Slovenia, as far as I'm concerned, could, of course, be more active in the, in the European Union. Ivo has been active in the Parliament, but I guess that there is another place where things are being decided, that's the European Council. And I really deplore that our representatives in the European Council have not raised the issue of Catalonia and, well, first, the issue of dialogue between the Spanish government and, and Catalonia. But I have <laughs> spoken too much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri, for your precious uh, testimony and contribution. And I would now like to, to give the floor to anybody who wants to ask something, to comment something, what the President said, and uh, to ask some question. Please, can you please introduce yourself also? I think we have only one. Can you make me walking with oh. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, to, to introduce myself briefly, my name is Kai Yej, and I would just like to ask a question to Mr. Puigdemont regarding some, some things you said earlier. We talked about exiting the existing systems of governance and decentralizing governance or increasing participatory democracy. So, do you believe that this process always has to be, at least for the sake of appearances, based on national identity, like it is with the Catalan people, or like it was with the Slovenian people, or can the interest underlying the sort of exit from structures also be economic, or in any other kind of social uh, situation? Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, to, to discuss on the identity issue, it's, um, is not um, it's something very complex because now w what's the be the way to construct wild identities in the last in the in the 20th, cent 20th centuries century you can build and you can consolidate an identity based on your uh, immediately environmental env env environment religion culture language that still exists, that still is important, but it's not enough in order to, um, to identify someone. The idea of citizenship, based still now in the right of soil, in the right of blood, is not enough in order to offer identity, citizenship to the all residents who are living in our society. There are a lot of people living in Europe with no papers or with no right to citizenship, because they were not born birth in, in, in our country or has not ancestors. That is something very obsolete. In, in, um, the right of citizenship must be split from the idea of identity, because in our society, that is for sure, we'll, are li we'll live a lot of identities in the same citizenship. So we need to manage differently, in different way. Who has a right to be citizen of one country? It's something um, due to the volunty of that uh, every, every people, every person. Um, and finally, you now have tools to manage the ways to identify a collective. We are not in the hands of the states. For example, one day, probably, in 50 years, we, we will discuss on the identity of non-territorial lands. Societies like Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter are creating identities. Nothing to do with the idea of official identities that means the right of citizenship. It's something new. And um, it doesn't matter if you are part of the rich or mm, less uh, developed uh, region. So our goal is to be a country as a result of our own effort. And in our, in our world, um, with more knowledge, 
with uh, more access to information, with technologies that allow us to understand from several languages, um, we must to protect minorities. The protection of minorities is one of the basis of human rights. And we are a minority. Not because we speak a language, because we speak a minorized language, which is not the same. We just are minority. We are a minority among Spain and among Europe. We are only 16% of the Spanish population. There is only 10 million people speaking Catalan in the world. So we are a minority. So our linguistical rights must be protected. And, must, uh, and, and, and now um, it's unbelievable, it's unacceptable to live in a society that threatens that uh, kind of uh, that minorities. So it's the survival of minorities is one of the best goals for peace and for progress. And that is one of the reasons to, I said before, it's not easy to understand, uh, well, who is Catalan or who wants to be Catalan or who is Spanish or who is, mm, it's not enough to answer saying, okay, my citizenship is that. But what about your identity? Or what about your linguistical rights or cultu cultural rights? Pues. I'm Anton Bebler, professor at uh, the Faculty of Social Science at the University of Ljubljana. Uh, in this room, I, I believe the only son of a former volunteer in the Spanish Civil War and a former captain of the Republican Army. Well, thank you for your presentation, and uh, of course, as everybody here, I'm, I'm elated by, the, by your presence, by your ability to come to our country, to revisit our, our country. Of course, all this expresses our deep sympathies for the movement of the self-determination of the Catalan. Uh, my question to you is, relates to the results of the last parliamentary election in Spain. How do you evaluate the results of this election uh, in, uh, for the resolution of the conflict between the movement for the self-determination of the Catalans and the opposite side in this conflict, the central Spanish authorities? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we must understand that there is no easy way to solve that conflict. It's not only a question of um, political minorities or majorities in the Spanish parliament, but obviously that affects. Let me say something very important in order to clarify what is exactly the uh, political situation in Spain. Yes, the Socialist Party has won. But if you look at the figures um, on the first and the second political group in the Spanish Parliament, which is the core of the political system in a parliamentary democracy, the last Spanish Parliament, the first party was Popular Party and the second was Socialist Party. Uh, they together, they have 2022 MPs in the whole 3,050. Not bad. Strong core of the political system in Spain. Now, the, the first and the second political parties in the Spanish parliament, which is the Socialist and Populist Party, they have 189 MPs. That is a smaller than before. That means the core, the center of the political system in Spain is uh, less strong than, than before. And that means there is a high risk of instability in Spain. Don't forget that in our 40 years of, since the approval of the Spanish constitution 
in the end of uh, 1978, no, in Spain, where there was no one single coalition government, which is something, nor which is something normal in the majority of the uh, Western democracies. Why that? There is no culture of dialogue, or having commitments from the different point of view. And I'm, I think that is the moment to have a coalition government has arrived. If not, instability will continue, and obviously there was not uh, enough majority or enough, enough political power to uh, solve, to try to start to solve seriously the Catalan crisis, which demands a lot of dialogue, comprehension, recognition to the other. One of the problems in Spanish politics is the, the, the political culture in Spain, based in confrontation, in um, very ag aggressive, um, believing that finding agreements is um, a kind of lack of courage, uh, is a, a sign of cowardry, is just the opposite in our case. We want to deal with the difference. We need to deal with the others, to find ag 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 agreements with people who are thinking like you, that is not serious, that is not nothing relevant in democracy. The most relevant thing in democracy is to find agreements with the opposite. Is that possible after the uh, results of the parliamentary elections? Yes, it was possible also in the former parliament. We voted for the Pedro Sánchez as a prime minister after uh, uh, um, censure votation, you know, a motion of censure. We voted for that because there was also a majority in the Spanish parliament for a renewal of democracy. But they decided to close that door. My question is, when Pedro Sánchez asked Spanish parliament to have a majority in order to be re-elected, to be nominated, sorry, as a prime minister, uh, he will uh, address a message for uh, that new majority with Podemos and the Basque and Catalan parties, uh, um, partisans for, for the, European, the, the right of self-determination, or will prefer uh, a pact with the pro-nationalist, Spanish nationalist party called Ciudadanos. I, can't, I cannot answer clearly your question, but I understand a lot of people in Europe are saying the results if there is a, a way to solve. But the only way, the only way is to start a dialogue process. Because if you need to start a peace process, you are late. It's too late. Is there anybody else who wants to ask the question or participate in the debate? I understand you were waiting quite long for us and I apologize once again for... ...patient, your solidarity. I would like to thank to somebody who is absent today because he has some other urgent uh, 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 duties uh, in, in, in Prekmurje. You guess I'm speaking about and I'm very grateful to him that he made, made it possible also, also to, to have this debate today. And I think there are many I, I, I told you, I apologize already to you, President, that the fact, about the fact that so many Slovenian media want to have an interview with you. And now you will be exposed to, to, to this big interest. But both of us, we, we know what is the media support, what does it mean. And I was 
all the time when I was when I was engaged in in in, in Catalan issue, I was so happy to enjoy the support of the most of the Slovenian media, and through it, the public opinion and through it, some of the some of the politicians, those who are some of them who are here and who don't dare to be at, 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 at events like this. Thank you very much. Thank you, President, and thank you, everybody, for participation.